Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Magnets. Um, so uh, the seminar format is, as usual, 25 minute presentation, during which I recommend you keep your microphone mute. Um, and then there's going to be time for uh, question and answers. Uh, any question is welcome. You can text, you can uh, put, use the chat box if you want. Um, and after uh, this part is going to be a part that is not uh, uh, recorded, that you can stay for an informal catch up. Um, it would be nice. So for today, I'm very excited. We have uh, Marco Maffione uh, presenting uh, uh, the, um, the presentation title Field Correction versus Net uh, Rotation in Polymagnetic Analysis. Um, so uh, thanks, Marco. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours now. Okay, so let me share. Okay, so let me share my screen and <clears throat> okay, can you all see this? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Anita and Craig. Um, so what I want to talk about today is uh, about a very broadly um, known and applied method in kinemagnetic analysis, which is the tilt correction. What I will talk about will be the, uh, about the limitation of this method and uh, how we can overcome uh, problems about this method with another approach, which is known as net tectonic rotation. I will also talk about the limitation of the net tectonic rotation analysis. Uh, so we'll conclude this uh, talk by showing you some data, some applications uh, of the net tectonic rotation that we did in the past. So um, to start, I first of all want to make some acknowledgements uh, because um, I'm not the first, let's say, person to use this one. I'm actually one of the last. <laughs> and all I know about this method is uh, coming from Tony Morris, uh, Plymouth. Uh, which I've uh, collaborated with uh, since 2010. Uh, so he told me everything about this, this method. So basically he's my, my mentor in this, <laughs> in this topic. He published several papers applying this method in, in Cyprus, uh, in the Trudeau Sophie uh, since the 1990, then 1998. He applied the method to other ophiolites uh, in Syria, and then we ended up writing a paper together in, uh, in Cyprus in uh, 2016. So what uh, we can uh, say about the tilt correction is that the tilt correction approach, it's, uh, it's mainly based on the assumption that deformation can be decomposed into two um, components of rotation. One is a tilt and the other one is a vertical axis rotation. That's a big assumption and you will see how this can actually produce some bias in the interpretation. So as a general point of view, what we typically do in paleomagnetic analysis when we uh, apply the analysis to um, deformation uh, uh, analysis and restoration, uh, what we do, we, we measure the remnants in a specific rock, which could be a sediment, or it could be a volcanic layer. And what we measure is called the in-situ magnetization. And then, because this unit is not um, as in the original position, but it's been affected by uh, local deformation, which here is observed as a tilt, what we typically do, we remove the tilt by performing a strike parallel rotation. By doing so, we correct this in-situ paramagnetic direction and we obtain a new in a magnetic direction that we call the tilt corrected direction. And then what we do, we compare once this is the tilt corrected, in other words, correspond to the direction of the magnetic field when the rock was horizontal. Uh, we then compare that to a reference direction, which is typically <clears throat> a direction from a, te a tectonic plate where the rocks has been sampled from. And we infer the vertical axis rotation. It's a very simple approach. Everybody used it, and uh, including me and other people. So it's nothing wrong with this, but I'll show you the limitations of this method in a second. The limitations have actually been already uh, identified in the, in the early 80s by McDonald, who published this paper talking about the tilt correction. And uh, he actually recognized that there are some um, 
miscalculations that you you may introduce by uh, when you have some specific uh, let's say tectonic um, configurations or or tectonic um, let's say process going on uh, in fact what he says is that you can actually uh, ended up recording not the true tectonic rotation but the apparent so in other words it's not the real one and when we have this it's essentially in two situations the first one is when the rotation are not parallel to the strike which is something one of the main assumptions of the tilt correction the tilt correction method um, we can actually infer, in fact have some uh, some weird uh, rotation well, not weird but some uh, um, let's say uncommon uh, rotation axis or maybe they are common who knows that are not um, horizontal uh, but they are inclined so in this case <clears throat> basically what you calculate you will end up calculating an apparent tectonic rotation. The second condition to um, introduce this bias is when you have multiple phases of rotations. So imagine some situation like this, when you have like first bending and then a faulting. So when you have multiple phases of rotation, you also end up calculating an apparent tectonic rotation when you apply a tilt correction. So, um, this is for sediments, so horizon originally horizontal layers. Uh, the situation is even more dramatic when we apply the tilt correction in dikes. And uh, I'm talking about sheeted dikes because it's what I've been uh, working on uh, so far. So, originally vertical dikes. Uh, if you apply a tilt correction on dikes, you are 100% sure you are going to introduce error. Uh, again, what we do, or what People have been doing uh, in dikes is uh, taking dike, performing a dike parallel rotation to restore it to vertical. And then from the tail corrected direction here, again, you compare it to a reference direction and you calculate the vertical axis rotation. Now, the main problem with dikes is that you cannot resolve any components of rotations that are perpendicular to the dike. In fact, if you look at this image, if you rotate this dike, which is originally vertical by 40 degrees, by 90 degrees, by 450 degrees, nothing will change to the strike. Or So what the only way here to realize that some rotation occurred is by looking at the remnants direction. So in dikes, the situation, as I said, is quite complex. It's quite critical um, when we apply tilt correction and you cannot resolve those dike normal components of rotation. In other words, because a dike parallel rotation is pretty much a big coincidence, so we, we imply that every rotation is most of the time not parallel to the strike, then we can conclude that applying this to dike can always, or 99.9% .9 of the time, introduce an error. Okay, so how do we uh, overcome this problem. The alternative method that have been introduced by Allerton and Vine in, in 1987, uh, it's called the net tectonic rotation. Now the net tectonic rotation um, is essentially uh, calculates a single rotation around an inclined axis that can restore the structure to the original position, which is what the tilt correction approach does. But on top of this, the net tectonic rotation also wants to restore the in situ magnetization to the reference magnetization. Now, the reference magnetization is the original direction of the magnetic field recorded by the rock when the rock was already was still in situ, so before any deformation. So, in other words, in the tilt correction, we only look at this portion. So we, we take the structure back to the original position and we calculate the um, tilt corrected magnetization, which is not here in this uh, approach. So if we look at dikes, for example, uh, when you take this dike in the original position, um, this dike is affected by some deformation. You can see here the remnants in blue, and we also uh, highlighted the dike uh, to this, uh, the pole to this dike in red. What the net tectonic rotation analysis does is calculate a inclined axis 
rotation that can restore simultaneously the dike to vertical. So in other words, this pole will correspond to that pole. So bring it back to horizontal, but also the remnants back to the original remnants, what we call the reference uh, direction. So it's a double correction. So you bypass the tilt correction, uh, the tilt corrected direction that you obtain in the tilt correction approach. Now, this net tectonic rotation analysis uh, is based on several assumptions. Uh, the first one is that you can identify that reference direction, and that could be the direction expected from a specific plate where you collected the data from, or it could be any other direction, it could be the geographic direction, so the north. You just want to see what was the deformation of your rock from north and so on. The second assumption is that as in any other kind of uh, paleomagnetic analysis, you want your remnants to be pre-deformation and possibly primary. The third assumption is that you want to restore your um, structures back to the original position. So we assume strata like sedimentary um, beds to be originally horizontal and dikes, not all dikes, but maybe uh, dikes in uh, ophiolithic complex, sheeted dikes, back to vertical. And the last one, and probably most important, uh, and you will see in a moment why, is that there is no internal strain in your rock. So the rock shouldn't be deformed internally. Now, let's see what the net tonic rotation analysis uh, can calculate for us. Um, so these are the three kind of input uh, data that we have at the beginning of our analysis. So we, we have measured the in situ magnetization of our rock. We have measured the structure. Um, this particular example is based on dikes that were originally vertical. So this uh, will be the pole to the dike. And that is our reference magnetization. So because we want to restore, so the net tectonic rotation analysis restores the in situ magnetization to the initial magnetization, which is our reference, but also the structure back to the original position, we can uh, obtain multiple solutions from this analysis. The first solution is the initial structure, the initial orientation of, in this case, of the dike. So what you have at the beginning is that your, the angle, between the measured magnetization and your structure, in this case, it would be the pole to the dike, that the, this distance measured as an angle, uh, angle beta, that angle will not change during all deformations that this rock can ever experience. So that angle will stay the same. So everything uh, in situ magnetization and pole to dike will rotate um, two, three, four, so many times, but that angle will not change. So what we know is that originally the in situ magnetization was coincident with the reference magnetization. So before deformation, that was our original magnetization. Because the beta angle will stay the same, then we can infer two conditions where our dike is vertical, which is because this is the pole to the dike, these two are the only two uh, conditions that will uh, restore the dike back to vertical, okay? So from this, we calculate the strike, the initial strike of the dikes. So the first solution of the net tectonic rotation is therefore um, in case of dikes, will um, allow you to calculate the initial orientation of the dikes. And you will see that you have two solutions. So you need to select the most uh, geologically uh, meaningful based perhaps on other geological evidence. The second types or the other kind of solutions that we can obtain with the net tectonic rotation is the rotation poles. Now, this, uh, this is an image, it looks pretty complex, but it's actually not. Um, and uh, I'll go, I will drive you through uh, each step of how we calculate the rotation axis here. So the three input vectors are 
this one highlighted. This is the, the remnants, the in situ remnants. This is the dike uh, pole, and that is the reference direction. So as I mentioned before, the net tectonic rotation <clears throat> analysis perform simultaneously two rotations. The first one brings the in situ remnants to the reference direction, which is basically what the original direction was before deformation. And at the same time, restore the structure back to its original position. So for a dike, like in this case, you want the dike to be back to vertical. And because we have two possible uh, orientation of the dike, it could be either that rotation or the other rotation. These two points are, you can see the beta circle, that will be the two initial dike orientation. Okay, so to perform the first um, rotation, we need a rotation axis that is contained within the bisectric plane between the two vectors. Okay, so we have two vectors. How to rotate this vector away from this one is through a rotation pole that lies within the bisectric plane between the two vectors, which is this great circle here. Okay, so that satisfies the first rotation. We have infinite solutions of rotation poles here along this great circle. Because we have to satisfy also simultaneously another rotation, which is bringing back rock to in its, its original position. To do that, again, we need another rotation axis, which brings this pole either there or there. And again, the rotation pole that brings this pole to that direction is along the bisectric plane, which is this red line. So also here you have infinite solutions of the rotation pole that can perform that rotation. But because we need for the net tonic rotation analysis that two, these two rotations are simultaneous, there is only one solution that uh, satisfies both conditions, which is given by the intersection between these two great circles, which is the red, uh, the, the yellow star here. Okay, so that will be the rotation axis that can perform uh, this correction. So bring back the initial, the in situ remnants to the reference, but also the structure back to initial, to initial position. You will see that you have also another solution here, and that's because we have two possible initial dike orientation. So you will have another great circle bisectric between this, the dike pole and the other alternative initial dike orientation. So you end up with two rotation axis orientation. And from this, you can also calculate the amount and sense of rotation that can perform this, um, um, that brings this vector away from the reference. So this, this method is, uh, has been written by, by Tony uh, a while ago on, on a DOS program, and, and I've worked on that uh, previously, but then recently have been implemented in, a, in, a, in an online software uh, developed by the group in Utrecht, uh, led by Dawe van Isbergen, uh, which is called paleomagnetism.org. And in this uh, online software that can perform a number of uh, standard paleomagnetic analysis, you also uh, find the net tectonic rotation um, protocol. All right, so this is pretty much what I, I wanted to tell you about the method. Um, what I, um, I will spend now the rest of uh, another five, 10 minutes talking about the application and bringing you an example of how we applied uh, the net tectonic rotation analysis to um, understand the evolution of the true dose of your light in Cyprus. Um, so the true dose ophiolite in Cyprus is a very uh, unique ophiolite because uh, it, uh, it's well preserved, but also it, because it conserves it, um, a fossil uh, spreading axis, which is the Solea graben here in the middle of the island of the, the ophiolite, but also a fossil transform fault, which is the southern true dose trans, uh, transform fault zone, a very long name. <laughs> this black line is the transform. So what uh, has been observed um, in the past is that the dike orientation, which is this pink unit here, 
which should be parallel to the spreading axis, which is the, uh, indicated here by the Solia Graben. Uh, so the dike, uh, when they approach the transform, they bend uh, to get more almost parallel to this transform fold. And um, this has been studied by several people, and they have realized that indeed the bend, the trend of the dikes that uh, looks more east-west, indeed is affected by strong uh, clockwise rotations. So that helped to understand the kinematics of this transform fold, and uh, we realized that clockwise rotations are typically associated with a, a dextral uh, strike slip fault, or in this case, as a transform. And therefore, we uh, develop a model about this ophiolite where um, the spreading ridge is located to the, to the left, the, the solia graben spreading ridge. And we need, therefore, another segment of the ridge located here to the west of the, the Aracapas uh, forest. So many years, a few years ago, uh, with Tony, actually, we, we performed some uh, additional uh, sampling in the western part of the Shidi Dikes complex of Cyprus. And uh, what we realized by simple structural analysis is that the dikes moving away uh, along this transect, moving to the north, they get bent, they, they actually rotate, uh, getting more into parallel to an east-west direction rather than a north-south direction. You can see here that we, over this region, we observe kind of two clusters of directions of the dikes. We then performed a classic paleomagnetic analysis. We demagnetized uh, our rocks with AF demag, and uh, this is the in situ uh, remnants that we uh, calculated from those dikes. And you can see that all of them are different from the TMV, which is the true dose magnetization vector, so the, the expected direction. So all those dikes have been rotated uh, from their initial uh, position. So we applied a tectonic rotation analysis because, again, you cannot apply a simple tilt correction analysis to dikes. Uh, we applied net tectonic rotation on all of these sides, and we calculated the initial dike orientation before deformation and the rotation axis for each one of these uh, sides. The summary of all this analysis is in this figure, and uh, I've divided here the results from the northern domain, which is the one that shows more east-west uh, dikes in situ, from the southern domain, which is more close to the, the expected north-south directions of the dikes. So as I said before, the net tectonic rotation analysis can provide the initial dike orientation, which is here represented by this rose diagram. And you can see that despite in situ, the dikes are in the south and north domain of the standard area. They show significantly, significantly different uh, in situ directions. They initially had a pretty much consistent uh, trend when they actually were in place in the oceanic crust. Then the second type of solutions of the net tectonic rotation analysis is the rotation axis which we, we modeled here, we showed the, the density distribution of the rotation axis. And again, what you see here is that those dikes have been affected by some kind of shallow, shallowly plunging rotation axis trending slightly to the Northwest. Then the interesting part of the analysis is the amount of rotation. So all of the sites have been rotated clockwise from the original uh, position. But you can see that this is the histogram, uh, so frequency um, uh, distribution of the rotations. And you can see that the north domain has rotation that has, are nearly double the rotations that we observe in the southern domain. And this is a pretty unique result that we could not have obtained with a simple tail correction approach, where only the, the net tectonic rotation can um, allow you to, to get those kind of data. Um, so in other words, to, to summarize those results, we observed, this is the studied area in Cyprus. And what we saw was that we observed an increasing um, magnitude of rotations 
move clockwise moving to the north. So what we interpret this uh, kind of trend uh, was, uh, was something similar to what you see in the, in the east, in the in, in nearby the southern Trudus uh, transform. And in fact, here, as soon as you approach the fault, the rotations increases. They are all clockwise because the kinematics of this transform is textural. And because we observe a similar pattern here, what we interpret was that we must have, or we, we, we should have another transform fault very close to the edge of the ophiolite. So unfortunately we cannot test this with field evidence because it must be here uh, just outside the ophiolite. But because the rotations here are so strong, we expect that this, what we call the Northern Trudos transform fault zone must have been very, very close to this location here. And again, because the rotations are clockwise, we need a dextro kinematics here. Therefore, we need another ridge segment to be located here in the West. So this altogether create a nice, um, very consistent um, dextro kind of step down of the spreading ridge uh, of, uh, that created this, this ophiolite in the back in the Cretaceous. So to place this result into the uh, in situ context at the time the ophiolite was created at 93 million years ago, um, we can see that basically the ophiolite was pretty much a, a, a complete ridge segment and perhaps the uh, transforms here, this is the subduction zone of the Neotetis uh, ocean that was going on at that time. Uh, so the isolation of this, uh, of this ophiolite must have been therefore um, aided or, or supported by the, the fractures, uh, let's say the discontinuities of the transform folds uh, that are in this, in this system. All right, so I want to just conclude um, with showing you some uh, pro and cons of each one of the two methods, so the tilt correction and the net tonic rotation. Now, and in terms of um, benefit or pros, uh, the tilt correction can provide paleo latitude, uh, which can be sometimes very useful for specific studies. So we really want to know the latitude of the rock, and you only can obtain that if you calculate the till corrected direction of magnetization, which cannot be obtained by the net tonic rotation analysis. The other pro of the till correction is that it's quite reliable when we deal with simple structures. So structures that either experience a simple tilt by just very normal um, kind of uh, geological structures like normal faults, reverse faults, and maybe with just one phase of deformation. The benefit of uh, applying the net tectonic rotation analysis is that it's the only method um, necessary for, for dikes, uh, especially sheeted dikes that were originally vertical. Okay, so if you're dealing with that, you need to apply a net tectonic rotation analysis. And the other pro is that the application can be uh, necessary in very complexly deformed structures. So when you have multiple phases of deformation. Then the, the negative side of the till corrections is that we calculate um, the apparent rotation um, in case uh, the, the deformation is very complex. So you don't calculate the true rotation, uh, which means that you introduce a number of, of errors in your calculations. And on the other side, the negative side of the net tectonic rotation is that you cannot obtain a paleo latitude uh, as you may need in several, uh, in several studies. The other negative side of the net tonic rotation is that there are some limitations due to some technicality of the method. And uh, because of time constraint, I cannot uh, discuss about this, but uh, there has been a paper published by Titus and Davis uh, last year that talk about all these potential uh, limitations of the net tonic rotations. Um, and um, yeah, with this one, I think um, I've, uh, I've concluded. So thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you. Uh, let's give Marco a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, beautiful presentation. Thanks. Um, now there is time for questions. Uh, should anybody? Uh, well, yeah, have... Lisa. Hi, I have a question. Um, so it seemed to me when I was working on dikes and trotos, yeah. that you have a you have a package of a dike swarm like in one outcrop. You have a bunch of dikes. They're not sheeted dikes. They're just a bunch of dikes. Um, most of them are not sheeted. Okay. And the average uh, was probably vertical, but but there's quite a bit of, um, you know, 10, 20 degrees yes. of uh, for any individual dike. So do you take, how do you approach that? Do you take the average yes. and then call that yes. used to be vertical? Yes. Yeah. So it's a good, good question. You're totally right. Indeed, when you go in the field, you see the dikes can swing quite brutally from, you know, from one another. They do um, what they want. Indeed, exactly. They go uh, where wherever they find the space. And uh, indeed, uh, my approach, which is pretty much what uh, should be uh, done in the field, is to measure multiple dikes from one location. Mm -hmm. uh, so I typically measured um, about ten dikes. And then calculate an error, okay. uh, take calculate an average, and then an error of that direction. Uh -huh. And in fact, something I didn't mention uh, is that you can go even further with the analysis. You can do a modeling of the error. Uh -huh. around, yeah, you can propagate that. Yeah, you can model the error around the three input vectors. So the the in situ remnants has an error, which is the alpha ninety five. Uh -huh. Then the dike direction has an error because of this measurement of different dikes in one station. And then the, the remnants direction also has an error, which is the alpha 95 of the remnants. So indeed that measuring multiple dikes is actually essential if you wanna do this properly. And uh, in theory, it should give the vertical direction when you average out, let's say 10 dikes, we may be off of some degrees, who knows, but uh, that's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. In fact, actually, the, the paper of uh, Titus and Davis, the one I mentioned at the end, uh, the, the limitations are, in fact, uh, basically introduced when the dikes are not perfectly vertical. Right. And they said they calculated exactly how much error you introduce mm -hmm. for each degree away from the verticality. Mm -hmm. and, um, but yeah. Right. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other question? Tony. Yeah, it's just a, a corollary of that really following on from Lisa's um, question and, and Marco's answer is that um, if you want to apply this to like discrete dikes in another setting, then you've got to be really, really careful because, you know, we you can be pretty sure that the average orientation of a whole suite of sheeted dikes is originally vertical because of the tectonic scenario in which those dikes form. But if you're sampling, you know, individual dikes that are cutting through sedimentary layers, for instance, or whatever, um, then they do go wherever they want to go. You know, they're responding to the local stress field and, and that might not be originally vertical. Yeah. So in that case, in those cases, neither the tilt correction nor the, the, vert the net tectonic rotation analysis are reliable enough for saying, for calculating the rotation of those dikes. So maybe better to stay away from those dikes. <laughs> maybe I was wondering, sorry to jump in, uh, if you can combine actually field evidence, for instance, if you have a dike and you know, that's intruding through sedimentary layers, you have some tilting observed in sedimentary layers, so you can kind of tilt everything back in yeah, a way. Yeah. I don't know if you need necessary rotation for that. No, yeah, I mean, if you have the, 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 the main problem with dikes is that you don't have the paleo horizontal. And if you do have a paleo horizontal constraint, which can come from sediments on top and between, who knows what the situation is, then yes, you can actually use that. And basically, you can either apply the net tectonic rotation uh, using the horizontal, so just bringing back those layers to horizontal. 
um, which I haven't discussed. I always made examples about dikes, but you can apply the net tectonic rotation analysis also to, to horizontal uh, layers. And, um, and then, um, yeah, so you can either do one or the other in those, in those circumstances. Sure, thanks. I, I would I would think that you can use kind of uh, multiple kind of restoring back if the deformation is assumed to be kind of co co coheval in a way, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, any other question? Greg. Uh, hi, Marco. Um, so you, you use the sort of differential rotation between the, the northern domain and the southern domain to uh, infer the presence of a, a transformed fault in, in the north. Um, but you say that, I mean, there's no other physical evidence there because it's, it's, it's no longer part of the ophiolite. Are there anything, is there anything else that you can look at to, to, to confirm um, that, that there was a, a transformed fault in, in the north of the ophiolite? We could move to the west, um, sorry, to the east and looking to the, um, look into the, the pillows um, because you, as soon as you stay to the west of the Solia Graben, you, if our interpretation is true, you should expect some strong rotation in the upper part of the Ophiolite. But also because the Ophiolite has a kind of a, the orientation is it's not suitable. So if, if I show again the map, uh, basically if you move from the highest point where we saw this high rotation in dikes, you move to the east, you probably get into this sedimentary cover above the ophiolite. Um, but anyway, that, that could be a way to test that, just looking a little bit more to the east and see whether you see the consistent rotations. Otherwise, I'm not sure how other, what, what other um, evidence we can claim because indeed the ophiolite just ends there. So the other part north of that potential transform never been in place so it's it's a it's an idea it's a model <laughs> maybe true maybe not <laughs> that's the data that's what the data are suggesting thank you lisa yeah so um i was just thinking there must be we have hundreds and hundreds of dikes that we build and have the data for um and, uh, and there have been so many studies, there must be thousands and thousands of dikes that have been drilled and, and measured and uh, all this um, stuff. And I was just wondering, wouldn't it be nice to compile all those data together in some consistent format so somebody could do a meta-analysis of the entire uh, thing? Um, yeah, I mean, sounds like it. A good project, <laughs> a big project. Well, I was going to yeah. put our data into magic soon. I, it, yeah. you know, bits of it are there, but not all that stuff that we did back in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, it depends also on the on the reasons, like what was the, the research question behind that? Like in our case, because the, for example, the net tectonic rotation analysis can restore the can provide the initial dike orientation. Mm -hmm. For example, I use that uh, to uh, reconstruct the, the spreading system in the Neotetis mm -hmm. by compiling multiple ophiolites uh, from Turkey, um, mm -hmm. Greece, Cyprus. Mm -hmm. And using that, I reconstructed also the subduction, the geometry of the subduction zone that was responsible uh, for the formation of those ophiolites. Mm -hmm. Now that is a very specific question. Um, right. And what we were interested in is what direction was the magma flowing when it went in there and, you know. There you go, yeah. So and we had to do some kind of rotation and we did it not the way you're doing it, but we did find that there were, it wasn't just vertical, there was also this. Yeah, which and, always happened. Yeah, I mean, indeed, so, flow directions could be another application of the, that tectonic rotation analysis of two, two dikes. I mean, that's what we were after, but, but you know, yeah. but it's just, right. there's just a lot of data on exactly. No, it's, it's, good, it's good that the data are there, that they're not lost, <laughs> but you know, we can always find time and, and, and 
people <laughs> to go further into the analysis. As far as the data are there, they will be there forever, I guess. <laughs> and the samples. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, maybe um, I'll do mine and then you can add yours. <laughs> Try to collect them all. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Maybe we have time for one last question. Tony, yes, go ahead. Again, just a comment. I think I think Marco's underplayed the importance of this bigger study that he's mentioned about the the sort of um, broader context of spreading in the in the near tethys because. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to look at these one, these single units. And, and I think, um, you know, all of that research that Lisa was referring to in Cyprus over, over many um, decades has been using this local reference direction. And it was, it was Marco's insight to use actually the a, a northerly directed reference direction that allowed him to work out mm -hmm. that the spreading axes aren't what you might expect in Tethys, which, you know, you'd expect an east-west trending ocean to have east west trending spreading axes but that's not the case and mm -hmm. and um i mean that that work was something that solved problems about data that, that been sitting around for years that no one really understood what, how you ended up with these northeast trending dike strikes in a in an east west trending o ocean so mm -hmm. it's just a comment really that i think you know it's downplayed the extent of that work it goes far beyond mm -hmm. cyprus which is yeah, much, much more important overall thanks only <laughs> Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, oh, we have uh, another question. Okay, end it. Yeah, so to come back to uh, Lisa's uh, remark about uh, correcting the flow or uh, the magmatic flow in these dikes, we actually have a data set from dikes in, uh, in Prudels. And what we want to do is now use the net tectonic rotation uh, to correct back uh, AMS patterns in these dikes to see uh, what the flow is. Um, so to do that full 3D restoration. Uh, so we'll see when we have time at hand to uh, get that done uh, and see what kind of outcomes we get and how much they differ from previous studies. Good luck then, sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> or a headache. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one of the things is uh, how to to uh, put that net tectonic rotation in Anisoft, uh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I think it's time to give another big round of applause to Marco. Thank you. And yeah, thank you very much for presenting. Uh, and. Um, yeah, if anybody else has questions, you know, you can email Marco or yeah, Tony. Absolutely. And um, yeah, now we can, uh, okay, uh, share the latest slides. I fixed the date, I got it wrong, my apologies. <laughs> yeah, thank you, great presentation. So um, yeah, thanks again, Marco. Um, our next speaker will be on the 6th of April, Janini from the University of Sao Paulo. On the 4th of May, we're gonna have Sanya from GFZ. 18th of May, Win Williams. Then we're gonna stop for EGU. And we are hopefully gonna then move to, uh, to Eastern Hemisphere time slot. And we always welcome more, more speakers and I would like uh, to remind you that you can review, rewatch, and spread these videos. Uh, uh, they are uh, on a YouTube, and you can cite them through Act Ref. Um, so thank you very much all for coming, and see you next time. <laughs>